First thing I want to point out is Genesis is a linear book. It follows a very linear progression of events from creation to the time of the Exodus. Chronological order of events. It's not written in a non-linear fashion. He's not jumping all over the place. Second, the entire Torah is also written in a linear fashion. And Genesis 6 is entirely in a pre-flood context. Everything he's talking about in Genesis 6 is pre-flood. They will look at the, my colleagues who disagree with me, will look at that phrase and also after that and apply it to Numbers 13.33 and some of the other scriptures that talk about giants after the flood. I say, no, there's nothing in the text that would indicate that this is in any way jumping nonlinear all of a sudden. And I'll show you why using both the scripture itself, the Hebrew, as well as the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra-biblical text. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same, I want to focus on that one too, became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. In Hebrew, the words that I've got highlighted there in color, giants is the word Nephilim. The word after that is interesting, it's akar, which means afterwards, after, following, subsequent. In other words, the next sequential order of events, the next thing that happened, after. When is the Hebrew word Asher, Strong's number 834, translated here as when, but more often it's translated as because. In fact, 73 times it is translated as the word because versus 44 times as when. Why is that important? Well, if you change that word to because, then all of a sudden it becomes a first cause issue as opposed to a repeat offense issue. They will use that word when and also whenever, and say, see, whenever they decide to have sex, they had produced Nephilim again and again and again and again, whenever they wanted to do it. And I say, no, it's a first cause issue, not a repeat offense issue. Now, mighty men is the Hebrew word gaborim, which can sometimes mean giant, not always. It just simply means mighty men. A giant would certainly be a mighty man. Would you agree? <laughs> but David's mighty men were also strong people, but they weren't Nephilim. <laughs> They were busy killing Nephilim, so it's the same word. I believe you have to really take that word in context, uh, how it's being used. <laughs> of old, where it says that they became, the same became mighty men which were of old, that's the Hebrew word olam, Strong's number 5769. This word means the very distant past. It is translated elsewhere as everlasting 110 times and as forever 136 times. It's not as in old days like, you know, a few hundred years ago. This is talking so far back, it's, we could barely remember it. And he says the same became those guys. All right? So if I were to expand Genesis 6-4 based on the interpretation of the Hebrew I just showed you, I would say it's saying there were giants or Nephilim in the earth in those days, that being the days of Jared. And also after that, that being the days after the first generation Nephilim were killed off, but still before the flood, when or because of the fact that the sons of God came in or entered, inserted their seed unto the daughters of men, and they bear children to them, the same from the pre-flood after that, became mighty men, which were of old, long, long, long ago, men of renown. Synchronizing the text. This is where, a re as soon as I started to understand, just in my, like I said, I tried to clear my own slate and look at the stuff just as as freshly as possible. Clean slate, start from scratch, God show me what's going on. And, and right off the bat, I, I really started to question the multiple incursion theory because I could find no confirming scriptures for it. So then I said, well, Lord, then how did they come back? If they didn't come back through multiple incursions, how did they come back? And as I looked through the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra biblical text, the story became crystal clear. You see in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, angels mating with humans. That syncs up with the references you see there in Enoch and Jubilees. Genesis 6, 5 through 7 uh, shows how God feels about the resulting violence that took place. And you see what syncs up with that. Genesis 6, 8 through 10 reveals how Noah and his sons were genetically pure. And if I was to get really dogmatic about it, Scripture actually only says that Noah was pure. It, it doesn't say anything about the rest of his family. It only says Noah was pure. Now, uh, looking through some of the extra biblical texts there, it says that Noah took his wife from, uh, his wife's name was Nema, and she was the daughter of Enoch. Well, looking at Enoch's track record, I think she grew up in a godly home. Would you agree? <laughs> uh, he was so godly, God said, hey, come home with me. Uh, so I, I think it's a reasonable assumption based on the context of what I know about Enoch, if in fact Nema was his daughter, to assume, it is an assumption, that she was pure as well. 
but I admit that it is an assumption. If it is true that both Noah and his wife were pure, then it stands to reason that Shem, Ham, and Japheth, all three, were also pure. Correct? So I'm going with that premise, that they were all pure. Genesis 6, 11 through 12, says that earth and all flesh becomes corrupted, and that syncs up with the text that you see there. Genesis 6, 13 through 17 says, God grows increasingly angry and tells Noah to build the ark and shows him how to do it. And you see the text that syncs up with that. Now here's the first mention of the wives of Noah's sons, Genesis 6, 18. And if we're following a chronological order of events, then the three wives don't show up until after Genesis 6, 12, which was the corruption of all flesh. How, how much is all? All is all. It's a stain lifter, that's all. <laughs> Just popped on my head, I don't know why. <laughs> so uh, if the wives weren't chosen until Genesis, after Genesis 6, 12, then they fall into the category of all flesh becoming corrupted. Tainted seed could have entered the ark through them. Now, my detractors would say, that's absurd. Why would God destroy the whole earth and just to let tainted seed go through the ark? Well, let's think about that for a second. What, what are, what are we, we're talking about genes here, okay? We're talking about microscopic uh, codes in somebody's DNA that would later get wiped out, completely obliterated by Israel's sword. No problem there. They get all upset about that, saying, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would God allow, if he's going to destroy the world because of, of, of corrupted seed, why would he allow corrupted seed or, or genetics to enter the ark? And I say, you're focusing on the symptom. I believe God doesn't focus on the symptom. I believe God focuses on the root cause. Because it is far more absurd to say that if the corrupted seed came as a result of watchers mating with women, for God to go ahead and allow that to happen again immediately after the flood. It's just going to create tainted seed again, all over again. So either way, whether you agree with me or whether you agree with them, you have a tainted seed issue to deal with. You have a genetic problem. In my case, it's just simply carrying forward through a couple of individuals. In their case, it's, it's, and, and in my case, I'm submitting that it's multiple generations le later of diluted Nephilim seed. First generation Nephilim were killed off in 500 years. I told you there's 1,200 years total, right? So that's what, 700 years left or so? In that time, of course, the 500 years the first generation lived, they had offspring as well. And they had offspring, and they had offspring, and they had offspring. So I believe we're talking about diluted Nephilim genetics by the time we get to the flood. That are, uh, and that, I believe, also explains why the giants are significantly shorter in the post-flood world. But they would subscribe to the idea that angels mated with women again and produced first-generation Nephilim again and again and again, causing potent seed problems. So we both have a genetic issue to deal with there. So let's continue. Genesis 6.12 is the one that I keep bringing up. All flesh had become corrupted. All flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. J Joshua 4.18 and Jubilees 7.24 really elaborate on what is being said in Genesis 6.12. Joshua 4.18 says, and they're judges and rulers, and there's some debate as to what that is. Are, are those men or are those angels? I don't have the Hebrew or the Greek to look at to verify what words were used, translated into judges and rulers. I suspect that it may be the same words used in Ephesians for archons, rulers. If that's true, then this could be talking about angels right here. But even if it's not, even if it's talking about people, it, it, it still works for me. Because according to Enoch, the first generation uh, Nephilim were killed in 500 years, and the watchers were judged and buried immediately thereafter. But in that 500 years, they taught men all kinds of bad things. So even if these are men, they're working under the premise and under the knowledge that was given to them by the watchers before them. So these individuals went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth and the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth and it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth, all men and all animals. So Joshua is elaborating on what was going on in Genesis chapter 6, verse 12. How did all flesh become corrupted? Because men started mixing animals and humans together. What did Jesus say? As it was in the days of Noah. Have any of you been watching the news lately? What have we been hearing about? And animal human chimeras. 150 of them in Europe last year in the UK. They announced 150 animal human hybrids were produced. That's what we know about. That's what they're telling us about. Imagine what's taking place in secret laboratories or in the military. 
exactly as it was in the days of Noah. Do we read anything in the news about angels mating, mating with humans? I haven't read anything about angels mating with humans. Have you? Well, they're mixing species. Jubilees says, and, and this is where Jubilees knocks the home run for me where, with regard to the after that of Genesis 6-4, because he uses the same phrase. And after this, after what? After the watchers were judged and buried and after the first generation of them were killed, they sinned against the beasts and birds and all that moveth and walketh on the earth. And much blood was shed on the earth and every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually, which is also a parallel to something we read in Genesis about their, everything in their hearts was evil continually. That's what's going on when you look at the the, the story in, in each of the synchronized biblical texts uh, going, uh, filling in the blanks, so to speak, of Genesis chapter 6. Sin against the animals, what does that mean? Sin against the animals is a reference to genetic manipulation, which created the animal-human hybrids of mythology, which appears to have also made a way for the disembodied spirits. Remember we talked about that, that the demons, where they came from, they, they're the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, to have host bodies to once again inhabit, thus bringing about their return. Dr. Judd Burton uh, has become a good friend of mine in, in recent months. I just met him. Uh, have, I've had him on my radio show a few times, and uh, we talk by phone quite a bit. He's written a, an extraordinary little book here called Interview with the Giant. Uh, I highly recommend you check it out. You can get it on lulu.com, Interview with the Giant. He quote, this is a quote from his book. He said, despite the loss of their physical bodies from dying in the flood, there is reason to believe that the giants, spirits, continue to exist. In this state, they were and are demonic entities. Like other sentient creatures, they have an eternal spirit at their essence. Therefore, the Nephilim and related tribes of giants never really ceased to exist. Only their physicality was lost. So if they're out there wandering around as disembodied spirits, they want a body back. Well, they, what if the creation of something God never intended to exist provides that opportunity? Because God created, Paul talks about that there's a spirit for, for man, there's a spirit for animals, there's a flesh for, for angels, a flesh for man, right? Uh, Paul talks about that. Well, God never created provision for this. He never wanted it to exist. So what kind of spirit would enter that? I think it's a reasonable assumption to say the only spirit fit to enter that are the disembodied spirits that were corrupt to begin with. I believe that's plan B. If no other angel is gonna risk the severity of the judgment, and they still wanted to mess with man, how are they gonna do it? Plan B, mix animals with humans. Here's an expanded version of the timeline I showed you earlier. This is, I believe, what happened in the latter days of Methuselah in the last 120 years leading up to the flood. You have everything I talked about earlier, the, the death of the Nephilim, the judgment of the watchers, Enoch's rapture, Noah being called rest, Noah's born, and then you have this latter day corruption of all flesh that's spoken about, spoken about in detail in the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra biblical text. You see there, I've got a dinosaur depicted. The question often comes up, where did the dinosaurs come from? Uh, who created the dinosaurs? This is my theory. Uh, I believe it's supported by scripture. Job chapter 40. And I always look, when I'm looking at translations of the Bible, I always look for this passage right here, Job chapter 40, to see how the translator translated this particular verse. It's, uh, King James says, Behold now behemoth. Some of the more modern translations will render that as hippopotamus or maybe elephant or something. No, keep reading. <laughs> if you look at the description of this behemoth creature, you see what I have bold right there. He moveth his tail like a cedar tree. Have you ever seen the tail of a hippo? Does that fit a cedar tree? <laughs> I'm like, come on, guys, seriously? No, I think this description in Job, that's why when I look at some of the modern translations, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. If you've got one of those Bibles that refers to this as a hippo, that's a good place for a Sharpie right in there, no. Behemoth, let's stick with that one. I believe Behemoth is referring to this creature right here. And God's proud of this thing. Look what God says. He talks about his bones are like bars of iron. He is, he is the chief of the ways of God. God's bragging about this thing. He's like, look at that! As a 145-foot Apatosaurus is walking by. Not a hippopotamus. All right. Okay, so if that's the case, let's say goodbye to a hippo. Bye-bye, hippo. I believe God created the vegetarian, the herbivore classes of dinosaur, the, the friendly vegetarian dinosaurs I believe God created. And I think the evidence for that, again, looking for evidence, I, I see this in Scripture, but I see this in history. 
the, the, this is a stegosaurus there carved a, in a temple in Cambodia in recent history, you know, a few hundred years, maybe a thousand or whatever years, I don't know how old it is. Uh, down at the bottom there, you see uh, rock drawings and cave drawings and stuff. You, you often see dinosaurs depicted with man. But you notice what kind of dinosaur it is. Herbivore, vegetarian. There are several different, and these are just a few, there are a lot more out there. I recently interviewed Dr. Aaron Judkins uh, on my radio show. He's a, another guy very similar to Dr. Judd Burton. Uh, he actually has a, a, a fossil track named after him that he discovered, one of the longest contiguous fossil, fossilized footprints of, uh, of dinosaur tracks uh, in uh, Polexi, down there in uh, Glenrose. And uh, he, he was there and saw the dinosaur tracks. If you've ever been down there at the Creation Science Museum uh, and taken a walk down to Paluxy, you can see human footprints right side by side, sometimes stepping inside dinosaur tracks. So yes, humans and dinosaurs did live together no matter what the evolutionists try to tell you. It is true. The only way this is possible is that they got through the flood. How did they get through the flood? There's only one way because it says the flood covered the highest mountains of the world. This was not a localized flood, it was a global flood which is why you have fossils in the first place. <laughs> How do you get a fossil? You gotta bury it with a lot of mud and a lot of pressure to fossilize the thing. You know, if this thing just fall by the side, of, the evolutionists will tell you this thing died, fell over by the side of a creek, uh, and then somehow became fossilized. No, the other guys come along and eat it. Have you ever seen roadkill fossilized? No, you see roadkill and it's shortly either eaten by ants or whatever, uh, you know, it gets, nature takes care of it. The only way it's gonna get fossilized is to very quickly get covered by an awful lot of water. That explains why we have fossils in the first place, a global flood. So I think Noah, being 600 years old, probably was smart enough to bring maybe a baby version of these on board. He's not going to, hey, 145 footer, 145 footer, beep, 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 come on, a little, little to the left, little to the left. No, come on, let's be realistic. But I believe that they did survive the flood. Okay, so uh, what about uh, this guy here? Where did that guy come from? I don't think that was created by God, personally. I believe that, again, Scripture helps us out here. Genesis 6, 12 and 13. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Do you think that thing creates a little bit of violence? I think so. I think that fits. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. First Enoch 7, 5. They, the Nephilim, began to sin against beasts, uh, birds, beasts, reptiles, and fish. Jubilees 5, 2. Men and cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walked on the earth were all corrupt. How much is all? All is all. Okay. All were corrupted in their ways and in their orders, and they began to devour each other. That's a violent devourer right there. I believe that was genetically engineered from existing lizards that God created, existing dinosaurs that God created. I believe that's an abomination just like the satyrs, the minotaurs, uh, and all the other uh, hybrids that we see in mythology. I told you we'd talk about the names a little bit. The names, it, there's an, probably the best $5 I ever spent is this, on this little book right here. $5. This, this book is a dictionary of scripture proper names. All it does is give you the names that are, you find in scripture and the Hebrew definition of what the names mean. We know that their names have meaning. Like Abraham, right? He's, what's, his, what's Abraham's name mean? father of multitude, father of many nations. You know, we've heard that. So when Abraham walked up to and introduced himself, basically what he was saying is, hi, I'm the father of many nations. His name had a meaning, right? Uh, so this is a book about the names and the meanings that they have. Well, Dr. Chuck Missler looked at the 10 patriarchs prior to the flood and looked at the definition of their names and realized, wow, this actually spells out a, a little paragraph here that actually tells God's whole plan for humanity. <laughs> Amazing, in the names of the patriarchs. You see the names right there in the column, what each person's name means, putting it in a sentence. Dr. Chuck Missler writes, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. There's the gospel salvation message right there in the names of the pre-flood patriarchs. Wow. Well, I started to look at that, uh, look into that a little bit deeper. Why is Jared's name shall come down? Well, because the synchronized extra biblical text will, will testify to the fact that that's when the watchers came down in Genesis chapter 6. They came down in the days of Jared. They descended. And so here's, here's this guy's name is shall descend. 
Enoch was a teacher of righteousness. Well, his he taught against the watchers. That's what the whole book of Enoch is about, him teaching against the, the activity of the watchers. Methuselah, Enoch's son. Uh, Enoch got revelation that God was going to destroy the world, and it would happen at the end of his son's life. And so his son is named, his death shall bring, and the connotation is judgment. So with, and sure enough, seven days after Methuselah's death, the floodwaters came. Lamech was named despairing because he was born during the time period of the first generation Nephilim. That would certainly make sense. If you look at all the corruption, the violence, and all the horrors that's going around, you would be despairing. He named his son despairing. But then what happens? All of this stuff that I showed you, the 500 uh, years ended, the first generation Nephilim were gone, the watchers were buried, all of that has, was done away with, and then Lamech names his son <sighs> Rest. Noah was born after the first generation situation. Let's look at it as a picture. Look at all the chaos that took place in the beginning there. Look at when it came to the end. You could see Noah was named Rest because there was an end of that corruption. And there was a period of peace for a little while until you get to the last 120 years. The reason I focus on the last 120 years is because I believe that's what God is saying when he said, my spirit will no longer dwell with man, for his days shall be 120 years. I believe that was when God was saying, okay, you better stop doing what you're doing. I'm going to give you some time to repent. And clearly they didn't, and things got worse and worse and worse until Genesis 6.12 manifested all flesh becoming corrupted. That's what I believe is happening there. Changing man's nature. This is a little nugget just recently read in Jubilees chapter 5. And their fathers, the watchers, were witnesses of their, their, the first generation Nephilim destruction. And after this, they were bound in the depths of the earth forever until the day of the great condemnation when judgment is executed on all those who have corrupted their ways and their works before the Lord. And he destroyed all from their places, and there was not left one of them whom he judged not according to all their wickedness. And he made for all his works a new and righteous nature so that they should not sin in their whole nature forever, but should be all righteous, each in his kind always. Could this have been a preventative measure to prevent or to ensure that angels and humans could no longer breed via sex? I think so. In the um, translator of this particular edition of Jubilees, uh, Joseph B. Lumpkin, has a little footnote on this. He says, as far as this author is aware, the recreation of man's nature is mentioned in no other book. This idea of human nature being altered as it existed before the flood is found nowhere else but in Jubilees. And I would disagree with him because as I looked at that, I thought, okay, remember what I said? I need two witnesses before I can hang a truth on it. I looked at what he, what he had to say right there, and I looked at that verse, and immediately Daniel 2.43 jumped into my head. And I'm just throwing this out there. Maybe this is confirmation of this idea that, that God changed man's nature such that angels and humans couldn't mate anymore, that there was a barrier put in place. Maybe that's why plan B had to be instituted. Just putting it out there. Daniel 2.43. And whereas thou saw iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Who's they? <laughs> Who's this they mingling with men? The seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Cleave is a marriage term for two coming together and becoming one. We see that many times in scripture, multiple confirmations of that. So I'm just throwing it out there. I'm thinking Daniel 2.43 may be a confirmation of what this is saying in Jubilees chapter five. The days of Jared versus the days of Noah. Because what did Jesus say? As it was in the days of Noah. The days of Jared were marked by the mating of angels and humans. Whereas, however, it was in the days of Noah that the creation of animal-human hybrids brought about the corruption of all flesh we read about in Genesis 6:12, which ultimately led to God's judgment with the flood. So if I were to take Jesus' words in Matthew 24, 37 quite literally, all we need to do is turn on the evening news. <laughs> there we're seeing a repeat not of angels mating with humans, as in the days of Jared, but rather the recreation of animal-human hybrids exactly as it was in the days of Noah. There's a couple of books that recently came out by Douglas Hamp and Tom and Nita Horn. And I just thought, found it kind of poetic as I was putting this presentation together. Just put these two books side by side. I believe the corrupting of the image of God. God created man in what? His own image, right? 
When we corrupt that image, we are opening forbidden gates. And that's what these two books are about, corrupting the image and opening up forbidden gates. That's what was taking place in the pre-flood world. Who or what are Nephilim? I think we need to define the Nephilim. We've been talking a lot about them. Strong's number 5303 defines uh, them as Nephil. Now, Nephilim, when you add the I am, some of you are taking Hebrew classes. Well, with Sheila and I, we were taking Hebrew classes. We learned that the suffix I am is what? Plural. So this is the plural form. Uh, it comes from the word nephal. Properly, uh, Nephilim would be defined as a feller, i.e. a bully or tyrant, a giant. Do you see anything in that definition that says exclusively a Nephilim is the offspring of angels made with humans? No. He's a bully. He's a tyrant. He comes from the word nephal. He's a plural form of nephal. Well, what does nephal mean? Nephal is Strong's number 5307. has a, a, a number of meanings. Some of them are cast down, cease, die, divide by lot, let fail, to fall. That's the one everybody likes to focus on, to fall. But it's got a lot of meanings. Uh, fugitive, inferior, be judged, perish, rot, slay, smite out, throw down. This word is actually used 435 times in the Bible. Only very few of those times is it in reference to the offspring of angels and humans. So I would submit that I think we need to have a broader idea of, of what a Nephilim is. There's nothing in the, in the word itself that defines it exclusively as the offspring of angels made with humans. So with that premise, I started to think, well, if I can think of this in broader terms, let's think of some of the possibilities. Here are some of the other uses for that word nephal in Scripture. The first time is in Genesis 2.21, where God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam when he created Eve. So what is that? Did, did Adam become a Nephilim? No. It's just simply the word to fall. Okay? In Numbers 5.21, it says, When the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot, the phrase to rot, that comes from the fall, and thy belly to swell. In Numbers 6.12, but the days that are, were before shall be lost. Same word, nephal, because the separation was defiled. In short, a nephal, im, is essentially one who falls, rots, and shall be lost, <laughs> according to this. I would just say it's something that has fallen or is less than what God originally created it to be. God created us in his image perfect. When we start corrupting that, you got a nephal. You got a nephalim. Something that is corrupted. So, Derived from the word nephal, nephilim are often said to be fallen ones, but we just know, we just, I just showed you there's a broader way to look at that. Some associate the nephilim with being the fallen angels themselves based on that one definition of to fall. Uh, I say not so because Genesis 6 says that the nephilim were the offspring of the fallen angels. So I don't believe the nephilim are the fallen angels. Put more simply, nephilim can be defined as those who are fallen from their original state the way God created them to be. Which brings up a question. Can Nephilim be produced in other ways besides being the offspring of angels? Obviously, I think the answer is yes. Based on the variety of meanings for the word itself, but also based on the story that is evolving, that is coming, about, uh, coming to light as we look at all these texts combined together, I believe that there are other ways to create Nephilim. So let's consider this. Created in whose image? We were created in the image of God, right? Genesis 1 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. We are created in the image of God. I credit this uh, insight to my wife, what I'm about to show you, about the possibility that the angels may have been trying to create something in their image. There's a variety of angels described in the Bible. You got cherubim and seraphim and archangels and watchers. There's all kinds of different classes of angels apparently in heaven. You got one class of angel described in Ezekiel 1, 5 through 10, where it describes a heavenly being saying that it had a likeness of a man. So here's this, this angelic being that looks like a man, but the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. Well, wait a minute, now all of a sudden you got a picture in your head of a, a satyr, something that's got part man, but it's got hooves on the bottom. Uh, it describes that this individual, these creatures, had uh, the hands of a man under wings. So now we know this thing has wings. And then it goes on to say that its head has four faces. It has the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. This is an animal-human hybrid coming out of heaven. 
But this is something God created. This is, this is a class of angel, whatever kind of being this is. God created this. This is the wheel within the wheel story where, where these beings come down. So if this is what some of the angels may look like, could it be that they were trying to recreate themselves, create something in their image, in their likeness, which is why they're mixing animals and humans together? Uh, just think about the implications of that. Now, would that create a host body that fits their angel-human hybrid demonic spirits to enter? I, I think the answer is yes. There's a movie that recently came out called Splice. I don't recommend you see it. It's a very disturbing movie. You'll it just don't trust me. Don't go see it. Very disturbing movie. But sometimes I like seeing the special features even more than the movie itself. And uh, the only reason I looked at this movie is because of the research that I'm doing. Um, the special features had a documentary where the director is talking about what their idea was behind this creature that they call Dren. Dren is the name of the animal-human hybrid that they create. Listen to what he has to say and to what their, their goal was when they were creating Dren. Listen to what he has to say, what they were trying to do with the creation of Dren. Heart rate stable. Splice is about uh, two young, brilliant scientists, played by Adrian Brody and Sarah Pauly. And uh, what they do is create hybrid organisms by splicing DNA from different species for a large pharmaceutical company. But they're young, and they're ambitious. And what they really want to do is add human DNA to the mix. But the company objects to this, so they do it in secret. And then terrible, terrible things result. You can't let her out. Specimens need to be contained. Don't call her that. Part of the excitement of watching this film is not knowing what Dren will ultimately become because she evolves in her life cycle. She evolves in a very radical way. And, uh, and she actually begins as, as something quite ugly, a, a creature or a child that only a mother could love. But as she grows, she turns into something quite beautiful, something that is possibly a step up on the evolutionary ladder. I always thought of Dren as a genetically engineered angel. So, mm -hmm. so she was always going to have a kind of bird component to her, and she was always intended to have wings, and there was always going to be something delicate and beautiful about her, and something, you know, maybe that's more beautiful than a human being. There is a sexual component to this story. There's a sexual component to the relationship between the scientist and the creature that's about as Freudian as you can get. You've crossed the line. What did you expect when you made it? Didn't you have a plan? The prime directive of any life form is to procreate, and when you create something like Dren, that's an aspect of her being that you're going to have to address. And I think what's so wonderful about the horror genre is that it gives you license to go to places that you could never comfortably go with a normal film. Come unstable. This is the disaster everyone warns about. A new species set loose in the world. I mean, this film, on some level, is about well, in many, on many levels, is about evolution. It's about how Dren grows up. In some respect, it's about how we as a species are growing up or evolving. And I'm almost certain that, given what's going on with this technology, that we are going to play a hand in our own evolution. Did you hear what he said? We're trying to create a genetically engineered angel. How interesting that even in the secular world, that there's a concept of what, what I'm talking about here. Could it be that these writers who are making these horrific films are actually channeling <laughs> some of the things the fallen angels are, may want them to portray? Could be. I find it interesting in this movie what he's, what he's he talked about how this creature develops. It starts off, they, they create an animal-human hybrid. It starts off as a very alien-looking creature in the beginning. It begins to morph into sort of a baby-looking creature, toddler, adolescent, and eventually a, uh, an adult female. They try to make her look really sexy. But by the end of the movie, she morphs into a he, becomes a male genetically engineered angel. And they say right off the bat, our goal was to create an angel a genetically engineered angel. Just putting it out there, I think that's exactly what was going on in the pre-flood world prior to the days of, of the flood, right here in the latter-day corruption of all flesh. That's what I think happened with the pre-flood return of the Nephilim. 